welcome to the second session of this morning. And our first speaker is Leslie Valiant. He's a British computer scientist in the area of theoretical computer science, and he is currently the T. Jefferson Coolidge professor at Harvard University. He received the Neman Lina Prize in 1986 and the ACM AM Turing Award in 2010, so each year he has two tickets for HLF. <laughs> His presentation is explicitly meant to be a companion talk to the presentation we heard from Edward Moser, and so we can be particularly uh, excited to see how these two fit together and where they match. Leslie, the floor is yours. Um, okay. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for coming. Uh, so this talk uh, follows on uh, perfectly, I hope, from Edward Moses' talk, where he pointed out that whereas in some parts of the brain very ingenious experiments have managed to uh, find uh, what has been computed, uh, for most of our cognition uh, we have had difficulty in finding out how it's uh, computed uh, in the brain. So there's a, a need for theory and there's a large area of phenomena which we don't know much about. So I'll just start by saying, so what has computer science theory to offer, um, which, may be, which is as powerful as experiments, so experiments are very powerful, but computer science theory does have this notion of computational limitations, so the idea that not everything we wish could be computed can be computed, and um, it may be that the brain is very computationally limited, it can just compute what it computes. So, so if we try to figure out how it works, then by ruling out things which cannot possibly work, we may find uh, um, some uh, uh, you know, good inspiration. So just as an illustration of the computational limitations, so just a very, very simple case, which uh, I'll just deal with briefly. So imagine a large number of light bulbs. They each flash off and on. These don't. Um, say uh, once every second, and they're all random and kind of independent, except that there are two which are correlated. So two of them are the same, say, 75% of the time. And the question is, by staring at these flashing light bulbs, could you or a rat uh, easily tell uh, which pair is correlated from a large number? Um, so here the point is that this is, you can think of this as an abstract computational problem, You've got like n streams of inputs, um, the zero, one sequences of each light bulb, and so how much processing do you have to do to find out the hidden correlated pair? And so the obvious solution is that you fixate on any pair, and then for each pair, after a little while, you can find out whether it's uh, highly correlated, but then you have to do this n square times for each pair, and that's very expensive, and we don't think the uh, brain can do that or do does that. And so people have looked at uh, the abstract problem. Is there a much better computational solution? Is there one which works in linear time, say order n? And no one has found, found one. So, um, so there are lots of interesting phenomena with this. But the main point I want to make is that it's conceivable that this, the, for this problem, which is a, you can regard as a psychological phenomenon, you can try to find people who can do this task, there's a real computational um, impediment to computing it, and therefore, um, it's impossible for biological organisms to do this for large n, the number of light bulbs. So I don't want to talk about this because I think this is probably impossible. It's too hard. So what we have to deal with are phenomena in neuroscience which exist and which we want to try to understand, but those which are challenging and hard to explain and because they're challenging computationally, we can rule out the things which don't work. But for this approach, the one thing you do need is some large n, so something which grows. Some, some task we, we can do as humans, which is impressive because it scales. We can do it on a large scale. Um, and so the direction I'll go in will be uh, uh, cognition. And how little we know about this is, for example, if you ask, um, so each person you've met here, um, maybe you remember the person, the question is how many neurons will you have devoted to this memory? And so no one knows whether it's one, 10, 100, maybe a million, maybe the question doesn't even make sense, but this is a totally open question. So we, we're kind of ignorant on this. But um, this is the kind of thing I'm interested in, so 
the task which I want to study as something with a very impressive N is symbolic processing. So I can tell you a story, Green Fox. I tell you it's the name of a restaurant. And I tell you, I went there, it wasn't very good. And it was recommended by Joe. And when I was there, I heard the election results. Um, and you can just take this all in. And every day you can take this stuff in. And so each of these acts of doing a, a, some sort of learning or association is one act. And what's amazing is that we can do many of these. Of course, you may forget some, but what's amazing is that we still remember as many as we do. And there are some phenomena like chunking. So when I say Green Fox is the name of a restaurant, we make a kind of a unitary concept out of two things which are separate. So that's also a phenomenon of symbolic processing. Um, but the main thing is that um, we um, can do this in a lifetime. It's hard to estimate, certainly at least hundreds of thousands of such tasks. This is my N, and this is what I want to explain. And so how you, act, how you memorize one act, there could be lots of theories, but once you impose this uh, quantitative constraint, then it really limits uh, what's plausible. And you know, if you ask neuroscientists, there's no generally agreed theory of how this is done. In fact, most theories probably uh, one would think up uh, off the bat would kind of wouldn't fit the numbers. So that this is what I'm discussing. So what I'm describing is, the, is a framework which may fit the numbers and it may be happening. And then I'll finish up with a comment that it's also experimentally testable uh, in the near future, at least certain aspects. Um, so just uh, um, very quickly, so there are many components of this. The so first is what is the cognitive phenomenon? How do you define it? Um, and certainly one can say several requirements. So each act of this uh, phenomenon of me telling you a name of a restaurant is like one-shot learning. I say it just once. You remember it. Um, you have to do many of these things. Um, also, much of this learning is done in such a way that you can respond to it immediately, immediate recognition. So it's not the, the case that this um, knowledge sits in the back of your brain and you have to start working on it to, uh, to use it. So this I call sub-circuit creation, that you actually have a circuit ready to recognize uh, the thing when it's mentioned again. Um, so things are composable. Um, so we want quantitative plausibility as far as re uh, resources. I'll say more about this in a second. Um, the model has to reflect some basic architecture of the brain, like that connections are one directional. Um, and also what I want to do is to have a set of primitives which is plausible, that between them these primitives are interesting as far as being a basis of, of cognition. Okay, so some basic requirements. Now some very basic facts about the brain. So I say that you know, understanding the computation of the brain is important, uh, but there are few things which are, um, have to be said at the, at the beginning. So the most obvious way in which the brain differs from a digital computer is that the brain doesn't have anything resembling addressing. So it doesn't seem to say, let's go to memory location 37. It works some other way. Um, second point is that the hardware is very slow. Uh, maybe in 100 steps, you have to do incredible things. Um, the neurons are sparsely connected. And in fact, it's communication challenged. So communication seems to be a big bottleneck. And that's a good for analysis because what you put at the neurons isn't so critical because you'll be, if you put a supercomputer at each neuron, it may not help you that much because for the tasks I'm looking at, communication will slow you down. Um, and then the resources are limited. Um, and the three things I care about are the number of neurons, N, the number of connections, D, and how strong each synapse is, the maximum value, which I call K. So K equals 20 will mean that I need 20, 20 neurons to be active at the same time to cause the next neuron to fire. And all these things are real resources. They take up uh, volume in your brain. And synapses also take up volume in your brain. Strong synapses you pay a heavy price for. So everything is uh, expensive. Um, and, uh, but one big piece of good news is that the long distance communication seems to be very stylized. It spikes. And uh, it's the time when it's sent which seems to be important. 
Okay, so, so what to do? Um, so the, before I get to the crux of what I'm saying, you have to do a, a few basic background things. And one is to have some sort of neural model. So well, what are my allowed steps? So I've got to call this this neuronal model, which I've looked at for, for a long time. Um, so basically, you've got a directed graph where you have the neurons at, the, at each node. Um, and each neuron has a little algorithm writing on it, which is local, uh, just reacts to the inputs coming in. And some decisions made early on in the model um, are important, and one can test whether more recent uh, facts from neuroscience agree with it, and the ones I'm pointing out, they all do. Um, so one point is that you can't wish for some idealized neuron and have your theory about an idealized, idealized neuron um, in fact, there are you know, hundreds or thousands of different kinds of neurons. And the model allows that and predicts that um, because uh, if you want computation in 100 steps, um, you have to allow a variety of neurons. And that you're allowed to program them, and uh, they exist. A slightly more sophisticated decision in the model was what about synapses? Maybe all the synapses are the same. That would be elegant. But again, uh, you know, if you try to program simple algorithms, you find that having the synapses have some state um, is useful as well. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence now that synapses come in infinite varieties in biology. Also, um, to write algorithms for, for, for cortex, um, you know, timing is, is essential. And for example, one mechanism which uh, has been found is called spike time dependent plasticity, which means that if two neurons are active, then the question of whether you increase or decrease the uh, strength of the synapse between them depends on the relative timing of the activity. So this and many other timing phenomena are what you need to program. So the uh, dream is that in 100 years' time, a neuroscience book will look like an algorithms book where people have algorithms written out for everything when that happens. Okay. Um, okay, and then that's one view of the, of the model, and the other view is that which I've said already, is that it's a resource model. You've only got n neurons, you've only got d connections from each, and your synaptic weights are, are whatever they are, um, and the algorithms are fast and work in few steps. So I should say, whereas the n and the d can be measured and estimated, the synaptic weights are kind of very hard to estimate, so in the model, we, have, we, we use them as parameters. So we make predictions depending on the value of k. And in each neural system, you may have different values of k, and one plugs it in. OK, okay, so, um, okay so what to do next? So let's talk about representations. So if I have an item like a, like a restaurant, how do you represent it in the brain? OK, so, so in this model, um, the idea is that for this concept, you have a set of neurons. And you have a set of R neurons. So R is my fourth number. And uh, again, R is a parameter. It could be 10. It could be a million. But somehow, when this item, this concept, this restaurant uh, you're thinking about, then these neurons uh, fire. Um, and uh, okay, I should say that um, all these uh, choices, the modeling choices were made a long time ago um, for, for computational reasons for modeling reasons, but they seem to, be, to make uh, some sense as far as experiments. Um, and, uh, okay, so let's go. And just one comment is that um, the size of R, so how many neurons represent a concept, is obviously really related to the likelihood of you being able to experimentally find it. So for example, these uh, place cells or grid cells probably have enormous Rs, so the fact that you can find a cell which represents a certain location in this maze means that there must be zillions and zillions of neurons which represent that thing, because you're looking at a small number of neurons. You're, you're guessing at neurons, so these R's must be enormous. And there are a few other things, places besides grid cells and place cells, where um, things can be done. So in the olfactory bulb also, one can locate natural odors and link it to um, cells. Um, so as far as this locality, so is a, is a concept uh, related to a um, localized to a number of neurons? Um, 
So besides place cells and grid cells, so another area where they've been found, also in the hippocampal area, so well-known experiments done almost 20 years ago, actually on, on humans, are cells which respond to, uh, co to concepts which humans recognize, and so these are examples of the Bill Clinton cell. So um, these are recordings from a cell in, in time, and in this window, uh, you're showing a, a picture of something, and so this particular cell responds very well to these three pictures of Bill Clinton and less so uh, for other concepts. And by further kind of experimentation, one can verify whether this cell is particularly responsive to Bill Clinton. And again, the comment is that these cells were remarkably easy to find in this hippocampal region, which means that there must be a lot of them because you, you, know, you, you try the picture of Bill Clinton, you, you tried a few small number of neurons, and the fact that you've succeeded in finding some, correla some correlations means that um, uh, they were quite common. Okay, so, so this is locality, the question of um, does a concept, can a concept be localized to a certain number of cells? Um, but another part of my model um, is that, in fact, it's, uh, it's a random set of cells. That is not cells which are particularly well connected, but uh, seem to be random. And again, this is necessary for the theory to come. Um, and I think the uh, evidence for that is much harder to find. It's hard to prove that a set of neurons is, is random. But I think, uh, I think Edvard Moser convinced me that <laughs> for grid cells, there's some evidence for this in the sense that if you look at neighboring cells, which are both grid cells, then they represent different uh, phases. So for grid cells, the different concepts would be different phases and the different scales. And so if a concept is one particular scale size, and one, one particular phase, which is you know, whereabouts exactly, it's an image, then uh, the different concepts are, ra are randomly interspersed. Uh, okay, okay, so there's some evidence for both randomness and locality. Um, now, um, Next, um, we have to be a bit more specific about what, what are our concepts. So, what are the tasks? What, what, what's this cognitive uh, behavior? What on earth are we doing? So, this is almost the uh, hardest part. You have to kind of guess, but you have to be, make specific guesses you can work with. Um, and so, the most basic uh, notion one needs is some sort of rand storage allocation. So, if I have a new concept, like a new restaurant, and I do want to find new space in my brain for it, uh, what do I do? How do I find it? Well, in fact, what, what is the task? Okay, so, um, so this is a, not a restaurant now, but supposing I have this. This is a new concept. So there was a first time when you heard the notion of, a, of Boris Johnson. There was a first time. Um, so I have to define what happened in your brain. And uh, so this is storage that was allocated for this new concept. And in this definition, the idea is that you've allocated this new concept uh, using components of the concept which you already knew. So it could be some sort of facial features, vision, but here I'm assuming it's the name. So maybe Boris was a familiar name to me, and so was Johnson. So the actual task is, you've already allocated neurons to Boris and Johnson, and now you want to allocate neurons to this new concept, which is somehow related. Um, and so the, the task is that uh, your brain can do this already, so you want to find neurons somewhere in your brain and change some synapses so that in the future, when you do hear these two names together, then you will cause this set of neurons to be allocated. Okay. And so this new set of neurons, it shouldn't be too many, it shouldn't be too few. It should be kind of equal citizen with the ones you, you already, already know. So it's a very definite, it's a definition of a computational task. Okay. Um, okay, so this is also corresponds to chunking that I'm combining two concepts into one because my compound concept is important. Okay. And, okay, and my, uh, I've got four basic tasks, but I'll just describe two. And so the second one is uh, association. So there are hundreds of ways in which the word association is used in neuroscience. This is one particular one. Um, and the association is that uh, you already um, know two concepts and suddenly you want to make the association that when you think of this, you, sh you should think of this. And so here you've already stored two items, and the task is when you 
get some information is to change some synaptic weights so that in the future, um, whenever you hear Boris Johnson, you should think of Prime Minister. Okay, so, um, so these are very concrete definitions of tasks, which you know, I think are important to, to implement. Um, okay, so one further uh, question you can ask is, if I represent uh, concepts by sets of neurons, are they disjoint or are they shared for two different concepts? Uh, can I use some common neurons? And the idea is that uh, you can work it with, uh, with either, in either regime. Um, actually, the Bill Clinton cell experiments show that these sets can overlap, so some cells can do some totally uh, un unrelated uh, concepts. And obviously, if they're shared, the advantage of that is that um, you can have many more, large number of neurons per concept, but the fact that they're shared makes it harder to compute with and make sure that you don't get confused. Um, okay, so then, basically, I've told you everything that you need to know. Um, and then what happens is that, um, so we, okay, so we assume that the connectivity is, uh, you've got a random graph, and, uh, and the main point isn't that you want some pure randomness, but the point is that random graphs have lots of combinatorial properties, which are good for communication and that kind of thing, which we need. So you could spell out the different properties which you need, but uh, random graphs have them. And then let's assume random graphs. Then once you've got these parameters, how many nodes you have, so this is the number of connections, so this is like the degree of a node, this is the number of nodes in a concept, and so this is the inverse of the synaptic strength. So this basically means that if I really want to wake up this neuron by causing all these to fire, then certainly I need at least k edges coming from, uh, from these neurons to, the, to this particular one uh, to, make to, to make it fire, because this, the, the synaptic weight means that uh, I need at least, say, 20 of these. Okay? Now, of course, this set could be large, like it could be, I know, a million. This could be a million. K could be 20. So this may be a general picture that uh, you've got very large sets of neurons representing a concept and a very sparse graph between them, but that's okay because even if you rely on direct connections, then uh, it works. And so once you've got these numbers and once you've got, um, say, say you want to work with direct connections, then uh, you know, everything else is implicit. You can do some uh, probabilistic calculations and uh, Using the Bernoulli distribution, um, you can figure out some, some relationships you need. So basically, the story will always be that these four numbers will be related. If you know what algorithm you're running, then these four parameters will be rela related. So for example, if you know how many neurons you have, connectivity, synaptic strength, then you'll know what's a good uh, number of neurons to represent your concept with. Okay. And again, the idea is you... you you're born with this uh, random uh, graph, and each time you have some learning experience, you'll change a small, enough, small fraction of the weights, you change the circuit to do this additional task, that when you hear this, you'll hear this, and hopefully you'll interfere with the rest of your memories as little as possible. Okay, um, okay. so for neuroscientists, you could, this task I'm describing sounds exotic, but uh, basically, the Heb, the, the Heb rule is something very similar. The Heb rule, uh, enunciated in, in 1949, basically says that if you fire a single neuron, single, if you fire two neurons, then something happens to the edge between them. So here we basically generalize this notion to sets of neurons. And this, is, this is what you need for, to make algorithms run. Um, okay, so... Um, Okay, so that was one task. So another task I had is this memory allocation. It looks very similar, but it's a different task. Okay, uh, so, so before the right-hand side was a fixed set of neurons, now you're trying to find the set of neurons. So you'll find the neurons which are best connected to both the A and the B. And you can do that. Um, okay, so you can do some s computer simulations on this where you give it, uh, simulate a random graph, you give it a sequence of these tasks you're interested in, association, memory allocation, 
plus a couple of others. So I also do inductive learning in the sense of our first lecture this morning, but just for simple uh, perceptrons and see how well we do. Um, and uh, so the problem is that it's, these are quite challenging. So that's uh, some sort of new part of your brain. 8,000 connections, that's reasonable. This is kind of a moderately strong synapse. And this says that um, for each neuron, you should allocate 360,000 neurons. So this is like a third of, of 1%. So this happens to be similar to the Bill Clinton neurons if you do the estimate. Um, and then you try hard, and, and after about 3,000 odd actions, it, it kind of starts deteriorating. So the network uh, start, starts, to fa starts failing either to memorize new items or it starts forgetting old ones. Um, but if you ha use stronger synapses, then you can do much better. And this is a general uh, conclusion of the analysis that strong neurons basically are closer to Boolean neurons and they give you much bigger capacity. Okay. Um, so uh, you can do simulations, but you can also do analysis. Um, so I'll just have one slide for that. Um, so in the analysis, you assume that you've got this association. So these are sets of neurons. You want to associate x1 to y1, x2 to y2. C is the capacity, how many you want, you want to associate. And the question is whether you can implement this, whether your graph is uh, good enough, how big is C for your size brain. And uh, so here, it turns out that if you want to satisfy all the requirements, you can do quite a lot um, with the simplest uh, version but if you entertain uh, having uh, an intermediate level of neurons with very strong synapses and having all the actions go in two steps, then you get be better, um, uh, better capacity. Um, okay, so there's a small range of algorithms which are simple enough to analyze and simple enough to hypothesize as, ha as happening in, in, in biology. Um, so whether this one, this one may already be too, comp too complex to have evolved, but maybe not. Uh, but the direct connection ones are already quite powerful, so it may be that much of the brains run on these. Um, okay. Okay, so finding all these parameters is difficult in biology, but there are some cases where they have, and for the low-cost olfactory system, these numbers have been found and uh, makes some sense in this context. Um, so finally, I just want to conclude by the observation that um, some aspects of what I've described are experimentally testable potentially. Um, and uh, so the idea is that, uh, well, neuroscientists like to do experiments with natural inputs and maybe natural outputs. So these are some nerdy experiments that, which are done without natural inputs and natural outputs, a bit like uh, testing an old-fashioned circuit where you put probes onto the circuit and play with it and see what happens. So this was called in-circuit testing. So the idea is that you will uh, find a random set of our neurons, another random set of our neurons, um, and you'll find it in a part of the brain which does whatever task you're considering. And for this association, what you want is that if you excite A and B, in some uh, schedule, you want the result that later on you've trained it so that, so that when you just excite these, these, these will fire also. Okay, so the idea that you've, uh, you can learn an, an association, you can learn that this restaurant was bad, um, according to this theory, you're, you're doing this. And um, so this thing potentially you can do experimentally, and I should point out that the, the theory says, and it's kind of this theory needs to say that this thing has to work for, for random sets of neurons. Okay, it's not that they're specially neurons which happen to be well connected, because the only way I can make the system work is for random sets of neurons. But that's very good for experimentalists because it says, well, try anywhere and it should work. <laughs> okay, um, so, uh, oops, before that, um, okay, no, I'm saying this now. Um, but, uh, Okay, some difficulties. So one difficulty is that at this point we don't know the value of R, so we have to test different Rs. Another difficulty is that here, when you train, you have to simulate these neurons, and when you test, you have to record from them. So you have to be able to record from and test the same neuron. Okay, but uh, again, the difficulty is probably that these numbers uh, 
may be quite large. And uh, okay, but of course, in some areas uh, they may be small. So the fact that we can't locate if you put an electrode in a neural cell, you don't know what it's doing. Maybe because the number of neurons doing that concept, you're trying to look for a, a, con a, no, a neuron which has a certain concept, maybe too few. It's hard to find. Okay, but this is at least the, whether my functionality, uh, whether the brain is capability of the functionalities I chose, that's experimentally testable. Okay, um, okay. and uh, okay, so we're proposing some building blocks, some basic primitives of computation in cortex, and whether these building blocks the brain is capable of, one can test in the foreseeable future. What particular algorithms the brain uses, that's probably a slightly later stage. Thank you. <coughs>